Okay, in this lecture, we're going to talk about some fundamental behavior of reinforced concrete. Um, while I'm uh, sharing my screen, uh, let me just talk about working here in Japan. Uh, when you work here in Japan, uh, you, you work like really long hours. So uh, I get home, oh, I don't know, I get back to my apartment around 11 or midnight. And uh, I'm like one of the first people actually to leave the office. Uh, uh, what they do here, um, the trains quit running around midnight. And uh, if you get stuck in your office uh, after midnight, uh, a cab ride home is like around 300 bucks. So everybody here just scrambles to make that. It's called the last train. And I've never been on the last train, but I've been told they're just jam packed. And so it's this last train at midnight, it's just crazy. Um, and uh, one of the students told me here that if it weren't for the last train, people would just work uh, around the clock, but uh, they have to leave by midnight uh, to get home. Uh, there are stories of uh, other some companies where uh, people just sleep at the office and work. My my buddy here, when when it's busy, he sleeps in his office and and works. So anyway, so yeah, it's midnight right now, and I'm kind of worried that the the room next to me is going to get mad because I think you can hear me talking, uh, making these lectures. Okay, so. Uh, some of the class objectives uh, that, that we have um, are we want to get a handle on nonlinear structures because uh, we're going to start talking about how strong is the concrete so we load it all the way up till it breaks, you know, like this picture here. And when you load something that far, the behavior is definitely not linear anymore. Uh, we want to know what the critical material properties are that will define uh, this nonlinear behavior. A lot of the papers I'm working on now, um, we, we look at certain properties like the confinement of the concrete, the ultimate strains, uh, and they go into these fancy numerical models that we're doing. And uh, what we're going to do is to illustrate the transition from linear to nonlinear uh, we're going to look at a simple column mod, uh, model, and uh, this is from chapter one of the textbook, if you want to follow along in the book. Okay, so here are the fundamental assumptions, okay? Statics is always true. The forces add to zero, uh, and the moments add to zero. And um, in some of the crazy experiments, I'll, I'll share some pictures when I get back. Um, key things are like statics, and we use statics to figure out uh, where the zero moment point is and all kinds of things. Uh, this thing here is plane sections remain plane. Okay, that's a lot to write. So whenever I say plane sections remain plane, I'm just gonna write PSRP. And what that means is that if you had a beam and you drew lines on it like this, when you bend it, it went all the way up to failure. So you're gonna bend this beam like this. These lines will remain straight. Straight lines remain straight. Now, there are cases where this is not true. Um, if you have really deep short beams and you load them, uh, and this would be things like pile caps, uh, when you load them uh, uh, and they, they kind of look like this, Uh, these things kind of look like, I can't even draw it right. Uh, they, they look like this. The, the straight lines turn into S's, uh, like this. Plain sections don't remain plain. But we are definitely doing that. 
Okay, we're going to assume the concrete has no tensile strength. It does have, but it's one tenth of the compressive strength. We're going to just say that's zero. Here, uh, we're going to assume perfect bond. Um, <clears throat> we're actually uh, dealing with some of those issues here and experiments here. Uh, but what this means is that the steel and the concrete are perfectly glued together. So if the steel stretches one millimeter, that meant the concrete stretched one millimeter. Okay, and we're going to um, talk about the concrete and steel constitutive laws. Um, that's a huge thing in the work we're doing here. Uh, we talk about all these stress strain curves and we put into computer models. Um, and the stress strain curve for concrete changes if you put wrapped steel around it. We can talk all about that stuff when we get back. When I get back. Okay, so here's the column. Uh, <clears throat> okay, and then uh, you put an axial load on it. And uh, you can imagine if it was squishy at the top, it would look like this. But if you get far enough away from that load, whatever it is, eventually uh, it does uh, just uniformly compress like that. Okay? And so uh, we're going to say it strains a certain amount, epsilon, and the concrete and the steel will both move that amount because they're perfectly bonded, remember? Okay, now, in the elastic range only, so this is for small loads, uh, we're going to do something called the transform section. And the reason it's called transform is we're going to transform the steel and the concrete, as you'll see in a little bit. And so <clears throat> there's steel and concrete in, the, in this column. And again, we're going to assume no slip. So that means the strain in the concrete has to equal the strain in the steel. They have to stretch the same amount. And so the implications of that, okay, so um, here's this picture. I've got, uh, and you can't see that, but this is B and A. Okay, so the A is steel, B is concrete, and those two things are going to stretch the same amount in this beam, for example. Okay, stresses. <laughs> the stresses we just said are the same. Strain and concrete equals... Uh, strain and steel, okay, and uh, the stresses are just E times strain, but the E's are different, right? There's E of steel and E of concrete. So even though the strains are the same, the stresses are different because the E's are different. Okay, now to get forces, it's just stress times area. So let's focus on the steel force. Okay, so that's the steel stress, the area of steel. Okay, so there we go. But remember, the stress in the steel is just E of the steel times the strain. What if the steel was concrete and not steel? Okay, so what we want to know is how much concrete will we have to have to be equivalent to the steel? And by the equivalent, I mean it has to have the same force, uh, the same strain, but we want to use E concrete instead of E steel. Um, this is kind of weird to talk about. It's easier to uh, just uh, do the proof, and then the end result is actually very intuitive. Okay, so let's just do some algebra magic. Okay, this is what we started with, right? Area steel times E steel times the strain because E steel times the strain is the stress in the steel. Okay, this is one, right? E concrete divided by any concrete equals one. So you can multiply it by one. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move, I'm gonna swap these two, okay? So it's E steel over E concrete, A steel, E concrete. Uh, this ratio, we're just gonna call N, okay? okay? And so see, this looks just like a concrete force. Okay, it's, it's oops, sorry. This looks just like a concrete force. 
It's got an area, an E, but of concrete and a string. Well, this is a transform. N times the area of steel is the equivalent amount of concrete. <clears throat> okay, so N again is E of steel divided by E of concrete. It's about eight. <coughs> uh, uh, if you, this is like 29 million. And this is like three to four million. Uh, e of steel is always 29 million. The E to concrete changes. Uh, higher strength concrete has higher E. Uh, one of the projects I was working on here, the concrete was so strong, uh, this was actually about five. <coughs> but typically, E is around eight. <coughs> so what it's saying is that the equivalent concrete, the transformed equivalent concrete, the transformed area of steel, is just uh, eight times the area of steel, or the N changes, so. Okay, uh, to show that, here's a, a comparison to scale of the stress strain curves for steel and concrete. It's crazy. Anyway, this slope is eight times as steep as that slope. And look at the difference in strengths. Okay, so uh, uh, that was linear elastic behavior. Okay, so uh, you've learned a lot of linear elastic. You did statics, uh, mechanics of materials, and you've done structures one. All of that, everything you've learned so far is linear and elastic, okay? Um, so you can get reactions from statics, shear and moment diagrams, mechanics and materials, stresses from mechanics and materials, deflections from uh, structures one, and uh, you can do inter indeterminate structures if you take CEARE 4200. Okay, but remember, we're talking about the behavior right before concrete breaks, and so it's nonlinear. This is true. Statics, shear moment diagrams are true. These things you've learned are all non applicable anymore. So it's a little bit crazy. So you cannot use M, Y over I. You cannot use uh, W, L, 4 over E, I, 5 over 384. And you can't, if you've taken 4200, you can't use any of that stuff. Okay, this is uh, um, at collapse. Uh, a lot of the papers I'm working on here, um, uh, address all these issues and, and we're getting deflections, we're getting stresses, we're getting forces in indeterminate structures using uh, advanced techniques. Okay, uh, so that's the behavior uh, uh, um, principles. And the key thing is that uh, I want you to know that under small loads, things are linear and elastic, like what you've learned. But when we get to calculating MN, the moment, the strength, or VN, everything you've learned about stresses, deflections, indeterminate structures um, are not applicable anymore. Uh, it's kind of a bummer, but don't worry. We'll learn how to handle those sorts of things, and uh, we'll continue with the next topic.